Now to demonstrate that the resentment of envy that we're talking about is a sin, biblically speaking, requires minimal effort because there are numerous direct statements concerning its wrongfulness, wrongfulness in the text of scripture. For example, Galatians 5.26 says, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Or 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, which says, so put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Such passages, of which there are many, remind us that envy is contrary to God's will, that it's part of the old filthy garment of corruption that as new creatures we must take off. The scriptures also inform us that envy is a sin that's not to be trifled with, that it's a serious sin, that it's not some harmless peccadillo, but rather that it has the potential to rob us of our eternal inheritance. Paul in Galatians 5, 19 through 21 says this, Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. That's quite a list. Those are serious sins. And then he says, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, Paul here is talking about, I think, the disease of envy, not spontaneous occurrences of it. The doing of such things is describing, in other words, a continuous exercise when one is consumed by envy. And so the disease of envy, which is fatal, is present when resentment takes over, we might say, when it corrupts your affections, the things that you love, and then it metastasizes itself in your desires and behaviors. When serving that envy becomes your chief concern. In fact, in extreme cases of envy, a literal inversion of moral values takes place where your own weakness and your own inferiority, even your own envy, is seen by you as a virtue while the advantages and benefits that you wish you had but lack are then seen as a vice. This is what some philosophers call raisonnement, using the French word for resentment as a way to try to distinguish this extreme kind of envy. Which is to say that what can happen to someone who is in a perceived position of inferiority and they're feeling that kind of inadequacy because they lack something of value that someone else has, and this could almost be anything, a skill, a talent, some opportunity, etc. And the lack of that value makes them, as I said, makes them feel inadequate, inferior. And what can happen is if they are unable to eliminate the condition that makes them feel that way, if they can't acquire the thing of value themselves, or they think that they can't do so, or if they just don't want to put in the effort to do so, what can happen is that in order to do away with this perceived inferiority, they literally invert the ethical hierarchy and start calling bad things good and good things bad. Meaning that in order to make themselves you know, feel good, to have a, have a healthy sense of, of self-esteem, they begin to demean the advantages and benefits that they themselves lack. You know, saying things like, well, you know, having a lot of money makes you greedy anyway, so it's good that I don't have a lot of money. Or, you know, too much career success can really go to your head. It can make you, you know, conceited. And so it's good that I don't have any career success. And on and on it goes. And here's the thing. There's an even more extreme version of this. If that doesn't work, that's not sufficient, then some people will seek to prevent anyone else from enjoying the privileges that come with the blessings that this person is lacking. And here's one thing that I wonder, and the reason to go back to the Genesis 2 text is I wonder if this kind of resentment, this kind of resentment, is what we might call the second sin of Eve. 
The first sin, of course, being that she partook of the forbidden fruit. But the second sin is when she brings that fruit to Adam and has him eat it. And what I'm wondering is, is, is the reason why she did that is because she wants to prevent Adam from enjoying the blessings that she herself has forfeited. It's, you know, the kind of resentment that says, if I can't benefit from these things, then no one else will. You know, the kind of resentment that drags other people into the mire with you, which is the very resentment that Satan has. Right? Satan rejects God. He rejects his inheritance and all the, you know, the glory of, of, of serving as an angel. And, and then after that, when he loses all of that, it seems to be that his primary mission is to drag everybody else down into hell with him. Where if you, you know, if you won't or you can't get out of the filth yourself, in your anger and frustration, what you go about doing is trying to trick and deceive others into giving up their privileges in order to join you in your misery. And if you think about this, this is actually the opposite of the gospel. Because the way of Christ is to voluntarily give up one's privileges in order to justify others. The way of the Antichrist is to force others or to deceive them into giving up their privileges in a vain attempt to justify yourself. It's also a way of getting rid of unfavorable comparisons. Right? So you don't have to be reminded of how, how far you've fallen, how, how inadequate you really are. Which is to say that this kind of extreme resentment seeks solace in the mediocre, in the mundane, not the matchless and the majestic. 